She was the pretty teacher who made national headlines when she was caught having an affair with her student. It's like, where were you the day JFK was shot? Where were you the day you found out Mary Kay was having sex with a 12-year-old? I initiated the first kiss. Mary's behavior broke the cardinal rule of, of teacher-student relationship. The full story has not been told in a truthful manner. It bothers me that you make an artificial line and say anything above this is totally consensual. Anything below it is a crime. Who is the woman behind the scandal? Mary Kay Letourneau, next on Mugshots. Please help me. Help us. Help us all. At the end of the school year in June 1996, sixth grade teacher Mary Kay Letourneau took 12-year-old Vili Fulau out to dinner. She took me out because I finished all my tests and all my assignments that were late to turn in. And, and because I got 100% and on all of them, So you had completed all your work for the sixth grade? Yeah. And she was taking you out to dinner to reward you for that? Yeah. She started playing footsies with me, so... And I started kicking her feet away. She started coming back, and then we just started playing. And we ordered our food, our meal. They set it down on the table, and we, we ate. After dinner, they sat in the car in the parking lot. I asked her, what would you do if I was to kiss you right now? And I went over and I kissed her. Was that the first time that you uh, kissed? Yes. A few days later, Mary and Villy were parked in a marina in suburban Seattle. Did the two of you talk at all in the car about having sex or anything like that? Yeah. She said, uh, just... Just wait. Just wait till you're 18. Meanwhile, the local police were on their routine check of the marina. It was after midnight when they pulled up next to the van. They came over, and I was laying in the back seat, and she told me just to lay there and don't say anything. She'll, she'll do all the talking and, and uh, just play like you've been sleeping for a long time. And they asked her, um, if she's been drinking, and she said no, and when they found out that I was their student, mm -hmm. they started thinking like, hey, this kid uh, probably had sex with his teacher. The patrolman brought Villy to the police station. Mary followed behind in her van. At the station, they called Villy's mom, who told police that he was spending the night with Mary and her husband and four kids, and assured them that the situation was innocent. Mary Letourneau lied about why they were there, and finally, after conferring with Billy's mother, Suna, they released uh, Billy under Mary's supervision again, and that was sort of the end of that. Not long after leaving the police station, Mary would break the law. The exact date is in dispute. Mary says it happened a few weeks later in July, after Billy's 13th birthday. Billy says the incident was in June, while he was still 12 years old. We went outside, and uh, we went on top of her roof, and. We had, we had sex. On the roof? Yeah. And this was your first sexual intercourse experience? Yeah. Mary Kay had told me that she was involved with somebody, a younger person, that she had gone to a class with, a, a summer school class. Now, when she said summer school class, I'm thinking, College. Mary's best friend from childhood learned she was having an affair four months after it started. By that point, the stakes had been raised. She called me in October and told me she was pregnant. And I said, oh, 
And she said, and it's not Steve's. And I went, oh. And I said, well, is there any way you can pass the baby off as Steve's? She said, absolutely not. I said, would you care to elaborate? She said, well, the baby's going to have black hair. Mary and Steve Letourneau had been married for 12 years. They had four children. Steve found out about Mary's relationship with Billy. He did discover some letters and notes that Mary had made about her love for Billy, and he did go and confront the boy. He asked me how many times have I had sex with her, and I told him. What'd you tell him? Three or four times. And what was his reaction? He said, um, well, you know me and Mary are gonna be together forever, right? And I said, yeah. And um, he said um, he doesn't want me calling the house or having any, anything to do with Mary. And if I do get in contact with her, he's going to call the cops. What happened was the Letourneau family in Alaska knew that Mary had become pregnant by a student. And one of the distant relatives down here in Washington State found out about it and decided that it was very wrong to keep this as a secret. I mean, it needed to go to the police, and she's the one who made the call. The phone rang, and I'm the public information guy, so I got a lot of calls, and, and it was an anonymous call from a woman saying, I think you should know that one of your female teachers, elementary teachers, is pregnant by one of her students. We had nothing to go on, no name was given. It was a piece of information that I shared with the superintendent but we weren't able to act at that point until we got a call within the next few days uh, specifying who, who it was. Mary Kay Letourneau was 35 years old when the caller identified the father of her baby as her 13-year-old former student, Vili Fulau. The school district informed the police, who immediately questioned Vili. Afterwards, they arrived at the elementary school. So it happened that she was in a staff meeting she was called out of the meeting to the principal's office and taken downtown. My husband called me at home one morning and said, you're not going to believe this. I just saw on the news that Mary Kay has been arrested. And I sat down in my chair and I started to cry. There was a lot of denial, like this can't be true. I can't speak for the teachers, but what I was observing was, were those classic signs of a death, you know, shock, anger, denial, and everyone was at a different stage. There was an article in the paper, a little blurb, a uh, Highline School District teacher was suspected of uh, having sex with a boy, which is, you know, out of the ordinary. And so I started thinking, oh, poor teacher, uh, some kids setting her up. And then a day or two later, my good friend who lived next to Mary called said, David, it's Mary. David Gerke agreed to meet with Mary. Well, my reaction, of course, was just absolute astonishment when she confirmed that uh, it did happen. Mary was charged with child rape and released on her own recognizance. She went home to family and friends. And this is when she started the spin of, he's the love of my life. He's my soulmate. I'm totally in love with him. And I'm like, he's 12. How can you imagine a future with him? She was going to get a divorce. She was going to marry Billy. She was going to have custody of the four older children and this new baby. And everybody was going to be happier than ever. And, and she was sincere in telling me how great things were going to be. And I had to burst her bubble and say, Mary, you're either going to be in prison for a long, long time, or you're going to have to go through a treatment program, and you're not going to be able to write Billy or talk to Billy, and you're going to even have some supervision over you when you interact with your own children. Mary Kay's psychological state would soon be examined in a courtroom and questioned by friends. What drove this respectable teacher to start a sexual affair with her student? The daughter emulating what her father had done. Next on Mugshots. Mary Kay Letourneau was one of seven children born to John and Mary Schmitz of Orange County, California. 
She grew up in the affluent coastal town of Corona del Mar in an exclusive neighborhood called Spyglass Hill. Mary's childhood was every little girl's dream. Anybody looking into her life would think that she had it all. She had a privileged upbringing, she had a powerful father, but of course if you look a little deeper, that's not what it was. Her father, John Schmitz, was a college philosophy instructor and radical conservative who was national director of the John Birch Society. He was elected to the state senate in 1964 and to the U.S. Congress in 1970. How do you characterize the position taken here by most of these senators and members of the House? Is it soft? <laughs> soft. That's why we walked out. I said so. It's too soft for us. That was, that was my words. But sir, these are the most conservative people in the Senate. Are you saying they're soft on communism? I'm afraid when these are the most conservative people in the Senate, uh, then we're in a sad shape indeed. In 1972, Schmitz ran for president on the American Party ticket, the political party started by supporters of George Wallace. He ended up getting a million votes. He was as far right as you can go. There's no question about that. Um, and so was his wife. I mean, the two of them, Mary Schmitz and John Schmitz, shared this very conservative ideal that, of course, later would come back to bite them in a big way. As an outspoken conservative, Mary Schmitz was almost as well known as her husband. In the 70s, she appeared on local television debates against attorney and radio talk show host Gloria Allred. She was quite articulate, and I thought very bright, and extremely right wing. She was against incorporating into the law as a constitutional amendment equal rights for women. So I think that told me everything I needed to know about Mary, but she was also very much anti-choice against a woman's having the legal right to choose abortion. Despite their differences, Gloria Allred liked the Schmitzes and socialized with them. But she says she was concerned about the standards they set for their kids. I met Mary Kay when she came to the television show with her parents. And I was really worried about her because I thought of Mary and John as rather rigid people. They certainly had their views of what a family was supposed to be and how people were supposed to act. And they seemed so, frankly, rigid that it worried me about what would happen to children when they had problems. Would they be able to talk to Mary and John? They had you know, prayers before dinner. They had, you know, strict curfew. They had every kind of rule that you could imagine. Then, when Mary was 11, her very normal childhood turned tragic. She and her older brother were playing in the family pool. They didn't notice three-year-old Philip slip into the water and drown. People make a big deal that could this have caused some sort of a mental defect in Mary. She says no, but friends tell me that that incident did have a tremendous impact on Mary, on her life and on her, her relationships with others and her family. She adored her little brother, and I know that his death devastated her completely. Mary Kay Letourneau downplays every traumatic incident in her life, and the drowning of her brother Philip is one of those. Meanwhile, in their high school years, Mary Kay and Michelle Jarvis became inseparable, and the girls seemed to break all the rules. We would jump in her car and head to Mexico for the weekend, 15, 16 years old. And we'd just be go across the border and go to Rosarito Beach and book ourselves a hotel room. She was a girl that knew how to have fun. And she had no problem finding people to have fun with. She was a cheerleader. She was actually a nationally ranked caliber type cheerleader. She was not the best student. When Mary Kay and I grew up, we had big dreams of what we were going to be. She was going to be married to a, an attorney or a politician and have a very glamorous life and, you know, go to fundraisers and, you know, live in a nice house and be able to go shopping and the kids would be in private schools and a very utopian Newport Beach life. But as she dreamed, tension at home was starting to build up. I think her mother is a very cold person in general. I never saw her demonstrate any kind of warmth and character unless she was in front of the cameras, where she smiled very warmly. It was just always fighting friction. Mary Kay's relationship with her father was much closer. After his failed presidential bid in 1972, John Schmitz returned to the California State Senate and continued to teach at Santa Ana College. She was the apple of her father's eye. She was the golden child of this family. She was the only blonde, the only blue-eyed girl. She stood out. 
But then, in 1982, it was revealed John Schmitz had been leading a double life with a mistress who had given birth to two of his children. The mistress, Carla Stuckel, was a former student. John always seemed to be a true believer. He always came across as a person not only stating his values and beliefs, but actually believing them and living them. And here, the emperor was exposed. <laughs> he was wearing no clothes. He was exactly the opposite of everything that he appeared to stand for. It was a disgrace. Mary Kay was 20 years old and attending a local college when she found out about her father's affair. I think she and I were pretty much on the same page as far as how we felt about what her dad had done and why he'd done it, because he got, obviously, he was getting something from Carla Stuckel that he was not getting from his wife. Again, Mary downplays her father's affair, that it really didn't have any impact on her, but I know she was hurt. I know she was troubled by the fact that he had lived, you know, eight years of secrecy, nine years of secrecy that nobody in the family knew about, you know, that he had had two children, he had had this long-standing affair, and uh, had lived a parallel life, yet she was the closest one to him, and she didn't know. Uh, I don't think Mary Kay blamed her mother, but I think she definitely put responsibility where it should have been on both of them. When Mugshots continues, a Court TV exclusive interview, Mary Kay Letourneau talks about her relationship with her sixth grade student. I think the whole messed up thing about it is that she got married to someone she didn't love. She played with his head for 11 years. She told me she um, just had kids to make the family look better, just so um, her dad could be proud of her. In the fall of 1982, weeks after it was revealed her father had a mistress and two secret children, 20-year-old Mary Kay Letourneau left Southern California to attend Arizona State University. I was devastated when she went off to college. She went to Arizona and for the first time in nine, ten years, I didn't have my best friend around. At Arizona State, she met a handsome fraternity boy named Steve Letourneau. Steve came from, uh, from out here in Washington State. He was raised out here and um, his family's up in Alaska. Um, he's a Northwestern, you know, kind of guy. Certainly didn't run in the same circles as the, the Schmitz family, there's no question. One summer, she brought Steve back with her to meet me. And uh, we went to the beach that day and he had a friend of his with him. And I don't know, I guess he, had, he and his friend had gone off in the water to go swimming and I just turned around and looked at her and I went, what are you doing with him? I mean, this guy is a zero. <laughs> she made him over a little bit and tried to get him to look more what, what she thought a, a contemporary guy should look like. He had all the right physical attributes, but the mental attributes were sorely missing. Mary Kay was 22 when she became pregnant by Steve. Her conservative parents insisted she get married right away. She was four months pregnant when her father arranged a wedding in Washington, D.C. on June 30th, 1984. The newlyweds moved to Anchorage, Alaska, where Stephen Jr. was born. Steve took a job with Alaska Airlines. He'd been a baggage handler before he went to college and he's still a baggage handler, which really makes me wonder why he went to college at all. <laughs> but I don't think you need a college degree to be a baggage handler. In 1985, Steve got a job transfer and the family moved to Seattle, Washington. Over the next several years, money was tight, as Mary Kay would have three more children, complete college, and get her teaching certificate. She and Steve were constantly struggling in their marriage because they did not communicate on the same level. They were just totally not on the same plane at all in their thinking. Mary Kay got her first teaching job at Shorewood Elementary School in 1989. She was regarded as one of the leaders of her, of her school. She volunteered to be on lots of committees setting new curriculum. She organized a school yearbook that the students did for the sixth grade, kind of like the graduation before you move up to middle school. She was at district headquarters a lot, sitting in on meetings, you know, kind of the extra stuff that not all teachers do, that she would volunteer her time. I never could understand how she could work until the wee hours in the morning 
and then be at school the next day and function. I think as long as Mary was having babies, the marriage was kind of going okay because she could focus on these children that she was having. I think also when she got out there in the workforce and began working with other students and meeting other people, kind of reawakening, I think at that point the thing with Steve was just not going to work out, that she could see that it was slipping away. Financial pressure and career commitments caused Mary and Steve to drift apart. I don't know when Mary first knew that Steve was seeing other, other women, but I do know that when Mary found out about it, you know, maybe she was hurt, but part of it was she didn't really care because she was focused on herself and on what she was doing. In spite of their domestic troubles, Mary and Steve kept the family together. In the fall of 1991, they had just had their third child. It was at this point that Mary Kay started telling people about a very artistic student she had in her class, a Samoan-American boy named Vili Fulau. She met Vili in second grade, and people remember this to this day, that even in second grade, Mary was talking about this special kid. She called me and she was telling me about this student she had that was incredibly talented artistically. And he came from a poor family, not, you know, not a lot of means. You know, working background and really needed a boost and she was gonna give it to him. Mary Kay gave special attention to Vili. She enlisted his artistic talent for the yearbook and got him involved in other school activities. Three years later, their relationship was still strong. Were you starting to show an interest in her in the fifth grade? No, I just looked at her like she was an attractive lady. The following year, Mary Kay became Villy's sixth grade teacher. She and Steve had four children by this time, but her domestic life began to unravel. She was deteriorating. There's no question that she was starting to slip. Her finances were abysmal. I mean, she was sinking fast. Not only was her husband having affairs, but she suffered a miscarriage. And then she found out her father had cancer. Mary Kay would turn to the one relationship that had flourished over the years. Court TV spoke with Mary Kay Letourneau in June 2001 in this exclusive interview. When I first met Billy, he was one of my students. Thought of him in the same way that I think of all of my students. Feelings changed when he uh, insisted that he was going to spend the rest of his life with me. He was just a crush to me. I didn't really mean anything serious. I didn't really like mean anything serious like, for us to really like get close, but then we did. 12-year-old Billy began spending more time after school with the sixth grade teacher going to movies and art galleries. They would also start spending their time together at Mary's house. Both of them were able to get something out of each other that was lacking in their own lives. Mary was getting attention from somebody and feeling needed by what she thought was a man. She would see him as a, as a young man. And Billy was getting, you know, attention from somebody who said, hey, you're special and I'm gonna help you and uh, I believe in you. Did you have any physical contact with Mary, such as kissing or any intimate relations with her, before the school year ended at the end of your sixth grade year? Yeah. The teacher-student relationship now involved sexual intimacy. The secret affair would last several months. On March 3, 1997, Mary Kay Letourneau was arrested. She was charged with a crime of child rape and was released without bail. What few people knew at the time was that she was seven months pregnant with Villy's child. Her kids, you know, were swept away almost immediately after her arrest. She had no family in Seattle. She had nowhere to go other than her own home. Divorce proceedings had started, and Steve was basically uh, torturing her in very subtle ways. Three months later, just before Billy turned 14, Mary Kay gave birth to his child. By this point, Steve had moved out of the house. When I got to Seattle after Audrey was born, um, there was nobody there to help her. She had no one. Her mother refused to acknowledge Audrey as a grandchild, and her family was totally against her. No support. It's sort of a kind of family that you know, when something really bad happens, we look the other way. 
You know, we pretend like it didn't happen. We don't acknowledge it. And uh, if anyone asks us about it, we don't even know who she is. Next on Mugshots, Mary Kay pleads for leniency and then stuns the nation by defying the court. On August 7th, 1997, five months after her arrest, Mary Kay Letourneau entered a Seattle courtroom and pled guilty to two counts of child rape. Her new baby, Audrey, was now three months old. At the sentencing hearing, with her estranged husband looking on, she faced the possibility of spending more than seven years in prison. I explained to Mary, since she did not want to go to trial, she had to plead guilty and she'd go to prison or she'd go into treatment. She is an adult who sexually abused a boy, a sixth grade child. She committed a crime, a serious crime. A defense psychiatrist testified that Mary Kay had bipolar disorder, a form of manic depression that explained her reckless behavior. I mean, this is a very complicated case, psychiatrically as well as just in terms of the number of events uh, involved in it. I concluded that she was suffering from severe bipolar disorder, meaning both mania and depression. But the greatest impression was made by Mary Kay Letourneau herself. Your Honor. In what seemed to be a sincere expression of remorse. I did something that I had no right to do, morally or legally. It was wrong, and I am sorry. I give you my word that it will not happen again. Please, please help me. Help us, help us all. Her help us, help us all speech, you know, which we've seen a thousand times, is a complete fraud. Um, you know, Mary was acting. It was an acting job. You know, David Gerke told her, act sorry, and she said, okay, and she did. It was absolutely sincere, absolutely mistaken. Uh, by most people, including me. She hadn't done wrong by sleeping with Billy. The wrong was adultery. I know that exposing of, you know, this whole private situation hurt a lot of people. It hurt my school. The teachers that I worked with, it hurt my students. And without saying, of course, it hurt my family and my children. I was very sincere in asking for forgiveness. This has been an extremely difficult case in many, many respects. I am satisfied that the defendant is amenable to community-based treatment, although reasonable professional minds do differ. I am persuaded overall by the experts' opinions. Whether you stay out of prison is completely within your hands. Mary Kay Letourneau was given a seven and a half year suspended sentence. She would have to serve the mandatory six months in jail, but to avoid prison, she would have to adhere to three conditions. She needed to enter a sex offender treatment program, take her newly prescribed medication, and have absolutely no contact with Vili Fulau. On January 2nd, 1998, Mary Kay Letourneau walked out of King County Jail after serving five of the six mandatory months. She was let out one month early for good behavior. Did she really need sexual deviancy treatment? Hell yes, because she'd go to prison without it. Was she a sexual deviant? No. Mary immediately reported to her treatment officer. As a sex offender, flyers with her picture were distributed throughout the neighborhood, and she was forbidden to have unsupervised visits with her children. Putting her in a sex offender program and having her labeled a sex offender would be like sending somebody to the hospital for open heart surgery and removing their kidney. The treatment did not fit the illness. It takes a while to adjust. You have to go from a smooth, manipulative, uh, sex-abusing con man 
to someone that goes into the program and says, I'm bad, I really screwed up, I need help. She did go to a few of those sessions, but she couldn't buy into it. She didn't feel she belonged there. For someone like Mary that doesn't think she was bad, that thinks it's love, and on top of that, to admit that she's somehow so bad that she can't have her own children around her uh, made it very difficult for her to successfully get going in the program. You weren't supposed to see each other, or she wasn't supposed to see you, is that right? Right. Okay. But you guys saw each other anyway. Is that yeah. right? Why was that? We just couldn't stay away from each other. Is that because you loved each other so much? Yeah. The whole time after she was released from King County Jail, she immediately saw Billy. They, you know, started dating again and hanging out together. In fact, he was really missing an action from his home for about a month, living in Mary's car, sneaking into the house where Mary was staying, you know, with a friend. Um, they went to the movies, they went shopping, they went to the mall, they were buying stuff. Then, in the early morning hours of February 3rd, 1998, Seattle police officer Todd Harris was on duty when he saw a suspicious car. Decided to go ahead and investigate it. Mary was outside of the car and coming back towards my patrol car. At that time, I went ahead and got out of my car and uh, contacted her and asked her if everything was OK. Uh, she stated yes. Uh, I asked if anybody else was inside the car with her. Uh, she said no, and the driver's side door was open, so I went ahead, walked forward, and looked inside the car, and there was a uh, young man inside the car. You two were in the car, and the police caught you and arrested Mary. Do you remember that? Yeah. Did you tell the police that your name was John Peterson? Yes. Okay, how come you did that? Because I thought if they caught, saw her with someone else instead of Billy, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they'll let her slide or let her go. Mary Kay had been staying with a friend, another school teacher from Shorewood Elementary. I got a call at 3 o'clock in the morning, Monday morning, that, and her friend was sobbing and saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. They've got Mary Kay. They've arrested her again. And I was furious. One month after her release from jail, Mary Kay Letourneau was charged with violating the conditions set by the court. 5 o'clock in the morning. I was in bed. My wife gets up early, trying to wake up, groggy. David, Mary's been arrested. And, oh, no. All the effort, all the work, getting her into treatment, seeing her through her time at the county jail, getting her started on the program, gone, wasted. Less than three months ago, you were given the opportunity, Ms. Letourneau, for treatment. Within weeks of your release from jail, you purposely violated the conditions of your sentence. These violations are extraordinarily egregious and profoundly disturbing. This case is not about a flawed system. It is about an opportunity that you foolishly squandered. The suspended sentence is hereby revoked, and the original sentence that I imposed not long ago of 89 months is imposed. Coming up on Mugshots, Mary Kay Letourneau carries a secret to prison and turns against the people she trusted. Those lawyers, I'm sure, were overjoyed when she reoffended, and that it escalated that story into a tabloid heaven. Mary Kay Letourneau is serving a seven and a half year sentence in a Washington state prison. Since her first arrest in March of 1997, her story has captured headlines. When it was first announced that it was a female teacher sleeping with a male student, 
And then Mary's picture hit, and it's this gorgeous blonde with this cute, coy smile. There was this brief flood of media attention, local. Mary became really a tabloid superstar because she is quite beautiful. In late July of 97, it somehow came out that this was not just Mary Letourneau, an attractive young teacher impregnated by a student. It was John Schmitz's daughter. And remember John Schmitz, he was the congressman that this and that. All of a sudden, things started to light up. Mary Letourneau is a woman who knows the media, knows PR, and works it like a pro. I've got, and these are all compact, but these are, you know, these are all separate people from around the world, producers, reporters, radio stations, TV stations, that called, the, that I didn't get a chance to talk to, that I had to call back. Because of all the attention, David Gerke then hired Robert Huff to act as media representative. I was coordinating the setting up of interviews. I was also trying to manage the possible promotion of the story. There were a lot of inquiries from producers, book publishers, movie makers, and what have you, about uh, uh, doing the story for money. I was hoping that my attorneys were going to do the proper thing with the media, and I didn't realize to the extent that they were being motivated by money. I think the case was a triable case. In April of 1998, two months after her second arrest, Mary Kay changed legal strategies. She fired Gerke and is now represented by Susan Howards. I think she accepted the plea because she was assured that that was the only way she could keep custody and contact with her children. And yet, if you really look at the plea and you look at who Mary Letourneau is, anybody would have known she could never have made it through the sexual offender program or the SOSA program. She just, she's, she doesn't fit the profile. Then, in October, nine months after her second arrest, Mary Kay Letourneau gave birth to her second child with Billy, another girl they named Lexi. How did you arrive at the name Lexi? I just... It was a car. It was a what? It was a car that I liked. Lexus? A Lexus. Okay. The car. We're very, very concerned that the family has been so divided, not only by the sentence, but there are two children. Billy and Mary are parents of two children whose well-being needs to be discussed. And the bond between those two children and their mother is extremely strong. Whether they see her or not, it's there. Billy turns 18, is he going to have the no contact order lifted, which he could do. You know, is he going to marry her? Will there be a marriage in prison? Will it be over the phone? As Billy becomes an adult and continues to pursue an illegal relationship with Mary Kay, friends, family, and the criminal justice system continue to struggle with this unusual case, next on Mugshots. Is it your plan to marry Mary Letourneau? Probably, if it's possible, in, in the prison. And do you know whether or not they will allow that to happen over there? Hmm. Those are some details that you're working out, is that correct? Yeah. In June 2001, Billy turned 18. Before he can consider marrying Mary, he has to first petition the court to lift the no-contact order an order which Mary and Billy have routinely ignored. I know that Mary has been disciplined, sent to solitary uh, for probably almost nine months total for continued contact with Billy, either by phone or by mail um, or what have you. What was the purpose for which she was contacting you? She said that she had a lot of people helping her in and out of prison. And she said all she needs is my hand in, her, in marriage, or, or our marriage. And that 
if you uh, were to get married to her that she would be able to get out of prison sooner? Yeah. Even if we do get married while I'm still here at the prison, I know that we plan to have a more sacred ceremony with our family and our friends. After that, we're going to provide for our children. And I have six, so that's a lot of providing for. Mary Kay is scheduled to be released from prison in 2004. She will have to fight for custody of her children. Currently, Steve has custody of their four kids. They live with him and his new wife in Alaska, and while Mary is allowed to see them, they rarely visit. Billy's mother, Suna, has custody of Audrey and Alexis. They are brought to the prison once a week. I don't know if she fully has taken responsibility for the devastation that she caused her kids and her family. I don't know. I, I don't think she has. I don't know how she could keep a happy demeanor and everybody tells me she's doing well in jail and own the responsibility for what she did to those children's lives. Was John Schmitz thinking of his children when he had the affair with his student? Was Mary Kay Latorno thinking of her children when I mean, she had the affair with her student? There are consequences when boundaries are crossed. Unfortunately, those who cross them often are only thinking of themselves and they don't think that they're leaving broken glass all over, and others are gonna step on it and be hurt. After his affair became public, John Schmitz remained married to his wife, Mary. He died in January 2001, and the two children he had with his former student were never accepted by the Schmitz family. Mary's behavior broke the cardinal rule of, of teacher-student relationships, and there's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. And anyone who's a teacher or an educator would agree that there's no lenience there. It's just a matter of degree what the, what the punishment would be, but you would not want someone like that in a school district. Suna alleges the school district should have been more active in preventing the affair, and in the spring of 2000, filed a lawsuit against the Highline Public School District in civil court. One of the things that's most disturbing is it's being portrayed in the media as Falau versus Laterno or Laterno versus Falau, and she's not even a party to the suit, so that's totally erroneous. Did we think about intervening? We have thought about intervening because it's obviously without Mary there would be no lawsuit. Sometimes I feel like I should have never gotten close with her. It is a crime story, but there are tragic elements of it and a lot of it did spin out of control because of media interest, because of uh, personal interests of people you know, close to the case. Um, Mary and Billy really were, you know, taken advantage of and uh, that makes it a tragedy. I work at the law library. I sing in a group at the Catholic Barracks. I play on a volleyball team here. I help girls that are in basic education classes. I didn't ever expect that this would come out the way it did.